I'll go ahead and record. So welcome everybody. Today is Friday, June the 5th, 2020. And we are gathered here together in our virtual Zoom room for Friday morning men's group. And today we're going to be considering how we are called as Christians to respond to the, the death, uh, the tragic death of George Floyd. And we'll have a chance also to reflect a little bit about a wonderful panel discussion that was hosted at our church this past week. And so, um, you know, as we start, um, it's very interesting to me to watch how current events and also just controversial issues are hashed out in Wikipedia, which is this, you know, free encyclopedia that, that anybody can edit, but it really is an incredibly dynamic source of information and also window into society and culture. And I hadn't realized um, the significance until I did a little research um, about 846 and, and eight minutes and 46 seconds is the length of time that is associated um, with with uh, George Floyd's death, with with the, his killing um, at the hand of a police officer after he was in police custody, um, and um, it's uh, you know it's challenging depending uh, on a lot of circumstances you know to, to talk about this and the connections that um, that you have to this. Um, but it's important for us to talk about this because we're all in a different place with this and with, <laughs> with, with our, with our faith, with our, you know, with our lives. Um, this is a photograph that the New York times shared yesterday uh, in an article that was talking about the, um, the protests. And uh, I know we've, <laughs> we've said prayers, but I'm going to go ahead and just offer one more just to invite God's Holy spirit into this time. Uh, dear God, I, I pray that you would enter in uh, right now into our conversations. Uh, I pray that you would enter into our hearts. Lord, we know that you are real, uh, and we know that you call us by our name. Uh, Lord, we are hurting as a nation. Uh, many of us are uh, feeling very distressed by the events that we've, um, we've witnessed. Um, we have... Uh, family and friends uh, and neighbors uh, who are hurting. And Lord, it's a weird time because <laughs> we're not able to go together to be with each other in the same way that we normally could at church and in, in uh, different organizations. And so uh, we're in this time of isolation, and yet we're in this time of experiencing uh, a, a tragedy and perhaps a, a turning point in, in our nation's history. And so, uh, God, we just invite we invite you to be with us in this time and animate our conversations. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, so, so I want to start. I'm gonna I'm gonna read some some verses from the Bible, but I want to start by actually <clears throat> challenging us to think about the voices that we are listening to. And uh, I am not a psychiatrist, and I am not, you know, <laughs> asserting in any way that any of you or me need to go to therapy right now because of voices. Uh, what I want to observe as a Christian and a follower of Jesus is that we understand biblically from the Lord that the Lord can speak to us, and he does speak to us. We also understand biblically that there are a lot of voices out there, and there can be confusing voices, and there can also be voices of the enemy that are deliberately trying to sow seeds of discord and fear uh, and even hatred. And we know that we are called um, to listen to God and also to seek the fruits of his spirit. And we know that we can identify um, the voice of the Lord by the fruits that we see, um, you know, surrounding the voice and the commandments and the life of, of people and those that are sharing things. So I want to just first off say, I think that this is an opportunity for discernment and filtering. Um, and by filtering, I mean, <laughs> let's not just leave the news on all day long. Let's not just, you know, and I got to say this to myself because I'm in social media a lot. Let's not just, you know, marinate ourselves unendingly in um, the voices of, of the media. And I say that because the voices of the media are usually not sharing the voice of the Lord. 
and we really have to decide today, and I think this is true all the time, um, to intentionally seek God in his word, to seek him in prayer, and to make sure that we are putting Jesus foremost in our hearts uh, and not allowing the voices of the Lord to, to you know, take the, the center stage. And so here's a, here's a verse that I'll start with from 1 Corinthians. This is the letter that, that Paul wrote to the, the church at Corinth. And this is 1 Corinthians 14, verses 10 through 12. And I share this because it speaks to this idea of different languages, understanding, and the Holy Spirit. And this is what Paul wrote. He said, so it is with you, since you are eager for gifts of the Spirit, try to excel in those that build up the church. If then I do not grasp the meaning of what someone is saying, I am a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker is a foreigner to me. Undoubtedly, there are all sorts of languages in the world, yet none of them is without meaning. And I don't know about you, but in hearing about what transpired and happened in Minneapolis uh, and the things that have been happening around our country, um, the protests, the anger, the outpouring of emotion. Um, some of this strikes me like I am a foreigner. And, you know, I, I'll tell you a, a fast story. When I lived in Mexico City, so I, I went to college uh, at the Air Force Academy and, and got out got out of there in 92. And uh, I immediately went to Mexico to study for a year. And I lived in Mexico City and, um, you know, worked with some fantastic people, have some great friends. But let me tell you, I've never felt as much a minority and a foreigner as I did at that time. And I've traveled internationally to some different places. And China, I definitely felt, you know, felt that way in China, but I didn't live there for a whole year. And so there's a word in Spanish that's called guero. And guero basically means, you know, blonde white guy. <laughs> and, and so, and I don't even know if skinny is part of that or whatever, but I was the skinny blonde white guy uh, quite a bit. And, you know, I was at events where I was, I was the only white person there. You know, we went to a Quince Años, which is the 15, uh, 15th birthday celebration of a friend of one of my friends, way out kind of in the, in the boonies a little bit out, outside of Mexico City. And, uh, you know, I remember looking around going, man, I, you know, I am really out of, out of my element here. And so anyway, I think this scripture speaks to this idea that, you know, we are, are living in a world filled with lots and lots of different people. And so when people speak and when people share, there are folks that are walking through different paths on different roads and have had, you know, different experiences than we have. And so one of the things we need to pray for is the discernment of the Holy Spirit to try and understand what they're, what they're sharing. And so um, three things that I want to challenge us to think about and talk about today is number one, when you have seen these things happen on the news and you've read about them, um, you might have watched some video, what is it that you see? What is it that you hear? And perhaps most importantly, what is God saying to you? Uh, because just as our church, you know, continues and has had different periods, especially of intense discernment with our session and with our elders, um, you know, I think that's, that, that's, that needs to happen um, with all of us as Christians and followers of Jesus today. Um, we always need to be asking God for guidance on God, where are you leading me? What are you asking me to do? Um, but let's have, let's make no mistake about this. God's Holy Spirit is at work among us, uh, and we can and should invite him to speak to and guide us. And by the way, this is really good news because it is easy, I think, to become, uh, if not depressed, to be, to become pretty despondent and to become pretty down when you see what's happening. And if we, and this is something that Jim Cimbala, which I'm going to share a quick little video uh, from him here in a minute. He reminds us, let's not put our faith in men and women. Let's not put our faith in human beings because people let us down time and time again. The person that we need to put our trust and faith in is the person of Jesus Christ and is God. And again, 
you're probably not going to get that message by simply turning on the news. So one of the great things about living today, of course, with the internet, there's bad things and dark things, but there's also good things, is that if you put in something like, um, you know, fellowship of believers, brothers and sisters in Christ, Bible, you know, Google is going to give you all kinds of verses. And so here are a few, Romans 12, 5. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. 1 John 4, 20. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. 1 John 2.10, whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. Proverbs 17.17, 17, a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. <clears throat> and man, look at that. Um, didn't what Mark say just, you know, speak to that idea? Um, I've been thinking about this this week that, you know, one of our prayers needs to be uh, that leaders will step forward. Uh, we think about President Lincoln in the, the dark years of the Civil War in this country, and, and I think most people generally think of Abraham Lincoln as a fantastic president. Uh, he was a Christian, and he was a believer, uh, he was a follower of God, and, you know, the adversity of the Civil War, if it hadn't been for that, we might not have known all these things about President Lincoln and have known his character, um, and so Adversity, challenging times, uh, test us, they, it molds us, but it also provides opportunities, um, you know, for us to step forward in, in faith. Uh, 1 John 4.12, no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, <clears throat> there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to read the rest of the verses, but again, we need to marinate in this, okay? And I'm going to use that word marinate. I don't have a picture here of meat, but uh, like I've really gotten into barbecue uh, and smoking a little bit. I was encouraged last week when we celebrated the life of Dan Tubb by the talking about barbecue. And let me tell you, brothers, if any of you, when we have the chance to start traveling again, want to take up that torch of let's go to some good barbecue places in Oklahoma and we'll, we'll decide together, you know, whether they've got the best, I will sign up to be in that, you know, on that trip. Um, because, you know, one of the things about preparing good barbecue is that it takes time. And the preparation of the meat is sometimes just as important as, as the process of, of cooking it. And so that whole process, you know, God is calling us to be in. He is calling us to not just, you know, have made a profession of faith one time and then just go about our life like we, we did before. God calls us to be transformed, and we understand that, you know, God's word is one of the primary tools he uses to transform us. So amidst current events, amidst lots of voices, marinating in God's word, and specifically, I think, seeking these verses that speak to, um, you know, our, our fellowship as believers, right? There, there is no black or white. There is no male or female. Um, there is no nationality inside um, the church of God, the church of Jesus Christ. <laughs> so I want to share a little bit with you uh, from this guy. Uh, how many of you grew up watching Kareem Abdul-Jabbar play basketball? You know, some people believe he is and, 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 and was the best basketball player in the history of the game. Absolutely phenomenal. And of course, he also happens to be African-American. And he had an editorial in the, in the Los Angeles Times this, uh, this last weekend, I guess. This is from May 30th, um, where he, the, the title of it was Don't Understand the Protests. Um, the, the, what we're seeing is people that are pushed to the edge. So I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to read just a little bit of this. And this, these are um, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's words. What was your first reaction when you saw the video of the white cop kneeling on George, George Floyd's neck while Floyd croaked, I can't breathe. 
If you're white, you probably muttered a horrified, oh my God, while shaking your head at the cruel injustice. If you're black, you probably leapt to your feet, cursed, maybe threw something, certainly wanted to throw something, while shouting, not blankety blank blank again. Then you remember the two white vigilantes accused of murdering Ahmaud Arbery as he jogged through their neighborhood in February, and how, if it wasn't for that video emerging a few weeks ago, they would have gotten away with it, and how those Minneapolis cops claimed Floyd was resisting arrest, but a store's video showed he wasn't and how the cop on Floyd's neck wasn't an enraged redneck stereotype, but a sworn officer who looked calm and entitled and devoid of pity, the banality of evil incarnate. Maybe you were thinking about the Karen in Central Park who called 911 claiming the black man who asked her to put a leash on her dog was threatening her, or the black Yale University grad student napping in the common room of her dorm who was reported by a white student because you realize it's not just a supposed black criminal who is targeted, it's the whole spectrum of black faces from Yonkers to Yale. You start to wonder if it should be all black people who wear body cams, not the cops. What do you see when you see angry black protesters amassing outside police stations with raised fists? If you're white, you may be thinking they certainly aren't social distancing. Then you notice the black faces looting target and you think, well, that just hurts their cause. Then you see the police station on fire and you wag a finger saying, that's putting the cause backward. You're not wrong, but you're not right either. The black community is used to institutional racism inherent in education, the justice system and jobs. And even though we do all the conventional things to raise public and political awareness, write articulate and insightful pieces in the Atlantic, explain the continued devastation on CNN, support candidates who promise change, the needle hardly budges. But COVID-19 has been slamming the consequences of all that home as we die, speaking of African Americans, at a significantly higher rate than whites, are the first to lose our jobs and watch helplessly as Republicans try to keep us from voting. Just as the slimy underbelly of institutional racism is being exposed, it feels like hunting season is open on blacks. If there was any doubt, President Trump's recent tweets confirmed the national zeitgeist as he calls protesters thugs and looters fair game to be shot. And I'm not going to read the rest of it. I'm just going to go here to the end. But here's what he says at the end. What you should see when you see black protesters in the age of Trump and coronavirus is people pushed to the edge, not because they want bars and nail salons open, but because they want to live and to breathe. And his concluding statement is, what I want to see is not a rush to judgment, but a rush to justice. So I'm actually going to modify here because I'm talking too much. And this happens sometimes because I'm a teacher. Um, we have each, I've, you know, seen different things and we have heard different things. And so I want to, I want to go to our breakout rooms now, um, in just a second. And, and again, these questions of what have you seen? Do you see, what do you hear? And what is God saying to you? Are questions I hope will animate your conversation. Um, this, uh, panel discussion that, that was held at our church virtually this last week um, was focused on the topic, what does the gospel demand that we do in response to George Floyd's death? And to Eric's credit, you did not hear Eric say a whole lot in this conversation. Eric was listening. And Larry Crudup of Tabernacle Baptist Church, uh, Dr. Major Lewis Jemison of St. John's Missionary Baptist Church, and, and D. Lavelle Crawford of Avery Chapel AME Church. We're all in our sanctuary. And guys, I got to tell you, I don't think I ever thought someone would be on the, on the um, you know, at the front of our church talking about white supremacy and talking about uh, institutional racism, but they were and they are. And I think that it's important for us to hear voices talking about not just this issue around George Floyd, um, you know, we heard Herman talk about this last week with the, the boys that he has. I mean, I have a son and I'm not having to counsel my son in the same way that a black father is about a police stop. There's just a different reality that we, that, that we live in uh, to an extent. So um, I'm going to actually email you this because I don't have, I don't want to take the time to show it to you. But in terms of voices, we've heard Jim Cimbala speak before. He is the pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle. This picture is from back in 2017 when Shelly and our girls and I got to go there to a service and get to hear him. And his, his message is very powerful. But I'm going to actually email that to everybody because what I'd like to do now 
is actually um, give us time in our breakout rooms to talk. And, and by the way, uh, we talked about this at our, at our leadership. We might possibly go a little beyond the top of the hour. And if you need to go, I mean, we're not going two hours. This isn't going to be super long. But what I want to say is these conversations are so important um, that we don't want to just cut off, especially the sharing that happens afterward too quickly. And so I'm going to give everybody um, about 15 minutes. And I will give you some updates of time of when there's 10 minutes left, when there's five minutes left in your breakout rooms. Um, check in with each other, all right? And among other questions that you can talk about, who, who are you listening to today? And who is prophetic? Because that was something that has been mentioned in all this is prophecy that was mentioned in the panel discussion at our church. I also want to give an opening for you to share about your past experience. See, my mom asked me this last week, Wes, do you remember the Watts riots in 68 and all this? I'm like, mom, I was born in 70. I don't remember any of that stuff, you know? Um, but we've got a lot of older members here of our group. You guys do remember the civil rights movement. You do remember the 60s. So how does that color what you see and what you're understanding today? And then this last question is, how is God calling you to respond? you personally and us corporately as a church and so what i am going to do now is i am going to number one stop sharing my screen and number two stop recording <laughs>